Plugging in the solutions for EZ and HY and taking the time and spatial partial derivatives, after simplifying, we're going to get H Y naught is equal to minus omega epsilon over K times E Z naught. Now we have two solutions for H Y naught, one from Ampere's law and one from Faraday's law. So we can set them equal to each other. So I will write that here. That's a mu. Easy not. So we can cancel the easy knots. They are both on both sides. We can also cancel the minus signs. And then we have K over omega mu is omega epsilon over K. So now let's combine common terms. We're going to put both of the omegas on the right side and we're going to put both wave numbers on the left side. So then we'll have omega squared and we'll have k squared. And then let's put the material parameters mu and epsilon together on the left side. So we have 1 over mu epsilon. Well at this point we might as well take the square root of the entire equation of both sides. Then we wind up with an equation for omega. Omega is the square root of 1 over mu epsilon times k. Now, if you took ECE 3300, you might remember table 7-1. Here is table 7-1. In the fourth line of this table, you can see that 1 over square root of mu epsilon is just the velocity of the wave, up. I'm going to use, in this class, we're going to use v, or sometimes written as vp, for the phase velocity, because that's what's used in both of the books that I am referring to you to in this class. So if we do that, we can write omega is equal to, after we take the square root, we're going to get plus or minus. We had 1 over square root of mu epsilon. I'm just going to write that here as v times k. And since we're currently dealing with a wave propagating in free space, which is why I'm looking in the lossless medium column, we have v is equal to c the speed of light, and so we can write omega is equal to plus or minus c times k. The plus sign corresponds to a positive x propagating wave, and the negative sign corresponds to a negative x propagating wave. This expression is what's called the 1D analytical dispersion relation. This dispersion relation we've derived here for 1D propagation is rather simple. Since omega is equal to 2 pi f, this dispersion relation tells us that the wave number is linearly proportional, just with this one factor, to the sinusoidal frequency. That is, when a plane wave is propagating in air, all the frequency components, all these f's of the wave, propagate at the same speed, and they all propagate at the speed of light, c. We could say the wave is dispersionless, and measurements have been conducted to support this. Now what about the numerical plane waves propagating in the 1D model we created? For our 1D model, everything is discretized and put into a computer, and we had to approximate the partial derivatives using central differencing. If we derive a dispersion relation, we'll call this the numerical dispersion relation, for our numerical approximation of Maxwell's equations, would we obtain the same result as what we did here? This is our dispersion relation, the analytical dispersion relation. Will the numerical dispersion relation be linear with all frequencies propagating at the speed of light? To figure this out, we will have to go through the same procedure as we just did for the analytical dispersion relation. But we're going to start with the numerical approximation of the electric and the magnetic fields and we'll plug them into our numerical approximation of Ampere's and Faraday's laws. First, let's consider the numerical solution for the electric field of the 1D numerical plane wave. Since the electric field is evaluated at integer time steps and integer spatial positions, the numerical solution corresponding to the analytical expression here is E Z I N is equal to E Z naught cosine omega tilde 
So the tilde here means that we have the numerical angular frequency. It, it indicates that it's numerical, it's a numerical number. For t, I'm going to put in n times delta t. n is the number of time steps. If you multiply that times the length of each time step, uh, this together will give you a value in seconds corresponding to t, minus k tilde i delta x which corresponds to the distance in x, it would be in meters. Now the mathematics is going to get a bit hairy for this, so we're going to use a math trick in order to simplify the calculations. Sometimes it helps to simplify the math if we write a cosine term as a complex exponential using Euler's identity. So this cosine term, we want to use Euler's identity. e to the j theta is cosine theta, plus j sine theta, that's Euler's identity. If we use e to the j theta in place of this cosine that shows up in our equation, we can complete the calculation that we're working on, and then we can get the same answer if we had done all the calculations using the original cosine theta term, if, as long as we drop any imaginary component in the result. So that's equivalent to dropping the contribution from j sine theta. Let's see what this looks like. Using Euler's identity, we're going to write EZIN is EZ naught E to the J, and I'm just going to take the argument of our cosine. Similarly, for the magnetic field, which is evaluated at half integer time steps, we have I and spatial positions, I plus a half and n plus a half is h y naught, and I'm going to use Euler's identity again, so we have e to the j omega tilde, and instead of n I have n plus a half delta t minus k tilde i plus 0.5 times delta x. Now we should plug the numerical solutions for EZ and HY that we had on the previous slide into the 1D update equations we derived from Ampere's and Faraday's laws. So go ahead and try plugging in the numerical solutions for EZ and HY into our update equation, first for EZ from Faraday's law, as shown here.